Good morning, Highland. Good morning. We day on this first day of the week. And if you haven't heard, there's been some tragic news this week. A little family, our church family, has lost Jake Johnson in an accident. And as I was thinking about this lesson, whether to do it or not, I changed my topic. I decided to stick to my plan. I'm going to read the scripture and kind of bypass that part. But I want to emphasize what we're going to be talking about today. Hope for a better today. That's what the kingdom does. We have a future hope, of course, but we have a hope for a better right now. We go through a lot in this world. Faith and battle it out whether you're going through hardships or difficulties, you're wrestling with demons, inner ones, or spiritual ones. Sometimes we forget that we're supposed to have hope in this life because we're so clouded by so much hardship. The gospel is not just about tomorrow. The gospel is about today. There's something about the, the hope of today I want to share both in the wake of everything that has gone on this week, but also because we need a, a constant reminder of this. Constant reminder. I'm going to read you one passage. I have many passages I wanted to use, but for our scripture reading today, we're going to open our Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. When you open up your Bibles to the book of Acts, what we're reading is the continuing story of God's people, the followers of Jesus, and how they were implementing what it looked like to carry out the teaching. What we see the church do is not just simply something they thought up, but something they were guided to continue on, the teaching of Jesus. If you notice, in Jesus' teaching in the Gospels, there are at least two occasions when someone comes to him, what must I do to be either a faithful Israelite or to inherit eternal life? And the conversation always wrestled around the two great commandments, love God, love the soul, love the neighbor. It would be framed in different ways, but ultimately it had to do with the Ten Commandments and how you divide that up into how you love God, making the center of everything, no other gods, etc. But also how you love your fellow man by not sinning against them. And while you're at it, the early church, on the other hand, made it a voluntary practice to do exactly just that. Let's read. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony Many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. I'd like for you to just dwell on that for a moment. What does this mean? 
We know what it meant to the early church. There was a lot of generosity in that early church. Selfless generosity. People sold things to make sure their brothers and sisters in Christ were okay. They, they sold their possessions so that those without possessions could have something. This often makes us reflect on our own church culture, doesn't it? It makes me at times wonder if I'm living up to the ideal. And I don't know if you're like me, but I look in the mirror sometimes and I struggle to see that I'm living up to this ideal. I know I've been the beneficiary of many generous hearts. People have given up money for me. Possessions. They brought me into their family. They All because of our relationship in the kingdom of God. But this strikes at a deeper reality in the heart of Christians. Our possessions. What did Jesus say? What did Brandon remind us of not too long ago? For where your treasure is, there is your heart. Many times, for example, like the rich young ruler in the Gospel of Luke, which is the sort of prequel to the book of Acts, see that it was often the of our possessions that often gets us in trouble. Why? Because it is through our possessions that we either distance ourselves from our fellow man or see them as opportunities to bless our fellow man. They either become barriers the discussion of selling all that he had and giving to the poor after talking about what he must do, what is the thing he must do to inherit eternal life? Jesus was not encouraging him to a poverty life. He was challenging him at his core problem, covetousness. He couldn't let go of his possessions to do the kingdom things that are often asked of us. Who, who sells like everyone like everyone else who was selling not that everyone was selling but many people did sold their house or put land and then tried to keep the sort of the same fanfare the spiritual competition that I'm just like everyone else they lied about what they sold how much they sold it for and how much they were giving very Tragic irony there. But it comes back to the same issue. Covetousness of glory. Covetousness of glory. The early church, though, by and large, had a lot to aspire after. And to I, I uh, walk through a series called Chasing Acts. And the series was really about focusing on the zeal and the energy and the moving of the church. The early church was active and moving. They were flexible. They saw a need. They met it. They did what they need to do it. And all because they had the devoted side.
in your heart and in history that Jesus came, died, was buried, resurrected, and is ascended to the right hand of the Father. And that's where he is right now. And he will come again in glory. He will judge the living and the dead. It was sold on that. It wasn't faith like we chalk it up today, just a religious experience. It was reality. Their reality was anchored in that very thing that when you understood and lived accordingly. And it's easy though right now to get lost in the idea that our identity as the church is wrapped up in our worship. A lot of our theology has been about right worship, right worship acts, worshiping God and coming together. But if we only think gospel, if we only think the church is about coming together, our vision is skewed. It's about bringing our reality and making it have an impact and a difference in the lives around us, in the lives the, among our own people, and in the community. When everyone's afraid of dying, we're going like Paul. To die is far better. When everyone's worried, who's going to... It's easy to get sidetracked because worship is so important. This is where we come to tell God, thank you. This is where we tell God, I need more of your word. Feed me, nurture me, heal me, move me. But that's where we need to be moving <laughs> and inviting people to the redemption and healing of God that's in Christ. See, we need to follow. The challenge really today is to take a page out of the early church that understood the kind of brand of generosity that Jesus had. And make it ours. The fringe. You know, the people that have never been amount to much? The ones who are always failing? In the Gospel of Luke, there's a massive em em emphasis on those never going to be whatever we thought they were going to be. They're on the fringe. Jesus shows us in Luke. The early church shows us in Acts. For the rest of their lives to overcome their past or whether they apparently seem to succeed. But here's the key issue. In the church that I read about in the New Testament, the one we aspire to be, the church of God's original intent, no one did it alone. We are not ships drifting at sea, hoping just together, and we might anchor together. No. We are a people on a journey, a pilgrimage to God together. And when, it, when one of us falls, we all fall. When one of us falls back, we all fall back. One of 
us suffers, we all suffer. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. That those who have much may share with those who have little, that there be equal. See, this lesson about hope for today is that looking at the New Testament, we see that the early Christians took care of each other. Whether male or female, slave or free, Jew or Gentile, we're all in this together. Today we might say something like, whether black or white or brown, Today we might say something like Native American, White American, African American, doesn't matter. European, Australian, Asian, doesn't matter. Even if we went with some of the language of our world today, male, female, binary, non-binary, doesn't matter. And by saying this, I'm not trying to argue that barriers are human barriers to do what God is calling us to do. The hard things. The hard things. Because if church is easy, if it feels like we're on cruise control, we're not making a dent in this world. We're not. Because we're on autopilot. And when you're on autopilot, you plan. ways of this world but sometimes we walk through looking one way we come out on the other end looking a bit shabby looking a little bit roughed up but inside we're strong because God is with us see the early Christians lived out this sense of generosity it is this generosity that allows us to have some sort of back you know, support gives us support to get through this world. Just using the passage from uh, Acts chapter 4 that we read earlier, the early Christians raised money to take care of each other, to share it. They didn't just raise money to have a trust fund, they raised money to share it, to use it. And they made sure there was enough for all. And they did not ignore people's needs. The last one, I think, I mean, there's a lot to say about all three of these. But the last one? It depends. What needs are worth talking about? Right? Are they the needs of the people that we work with and are exhausted by how many needs they have? Who's really impoverished? Is it us? The ones who feel that we have it all together and they should have it all together by now? See, I don't read that the early church Ignore people's needs. And I'm not saying this because it, it, it's a rebuke of this congregation. I'm saying we have, to, we have to keep challenging ourselves to ask whether or not we are putting limits on how we live out the gospel and how the church takes care of its own. If we don't challenge ourselves, we get relaxed. We get complacent. 
We just might miss people we need to be taking care of. But the early church was willing to do this, this is my point. They were willing to be generous, not seasonally. Acts 2, 44-46. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Really doesn't that wouldn't sit well, Mr. Dusen, would it? Being in each other's homes daily. I see those memes where he's looking through the window, people's homes. You know, when we remember that there are bigger things going on. Yes, diseases are real. Yes, problems are real. But the biggest problem <clears throat> being there for people when they're hurting, holding them when they're Gospel of Jesus Christ. Who knows there are greater things than this? The early church understood this. But sometimes we don't know who's in need. Sometimes we don't know who's in need. And we're not allowed to serve. We're not able to serve each other because we don't know who's in need. Sometimes it's because we are often made to be, if I tell someone I'm in need, if I tell someone I, I need financial help, if I tell someone I, I need some extra food, or if I tell people, I'm going to turn this mic off. If I tell people, if I tell someone my problems, I'm too embarrassed. Maybe some of us have jobs that haven't provided for us the way we hoped. Maybe the economy shifted and our industry is falling apart. Maybe we've lost jobs. Maybe we haven't been as responsible to do the things we need to do. Maybe we've gotten sick. Whatever it is. Sometimes we get a little too proud. We don't let our brothers and sisters know our problems. How can we be God's people taking care of each other if we're not helping each other through each other's problems? Because what happens is I'm going through something and my church experience doesn't feel like we're connected or I'm not involved or I can't help people. The Bible says help each other, bear each other's burden when I don't know what their burdens are. And why get upset at the church for not helping you when you don't tell them your needs? And why have a sense of distance when all you have to say is one simple word, help? I don't know if you know this, but I was up at Lake Tahoe and I went kayaking and my kayak uh, began to sink. Um, and uh, I decided to flip my kayak over and I would just swim back. Uh, I'm not an expert swimmer, like, you know, like Adam Rollins or anything, but I'm, I'm a decent swimmer. And all of a sudden, the cold, icy waters began to freeze my limbs. I couldn't hold them. I this uh, this paddle boat two ladies on it 
and I yelled as best as I could, help, in English. All they said was, eh? I realized they were Spanish. That's the Spanish, that is the sign that the person speaks Spanish, eh? So then I said, ayúdame, which in translation means help me. And then they paddled to me, and I was able to hold up, and they brought me into the shore. But if I didn't tell them, if I felt, oh, I'm a good swimmer, I was a swim coach when I was in middle school. I wouldn't have, so I wouldn't be here today. I really believe that. At church, we do that. We try to swim it out by ourselves. I wonder why we're drowning by ourselves. And the church experience feels so impoverished because we want to do things like this. We want to do big and hard things like this. But we don't get a chance. And we lose a beautiful opportunity to illustrate the kingdom of God. Changing people's lives. We want to be able to help those who we can and give to them. We want to show hope to those who are needed and give them something. But they have to be willing to receive it. We have to be willing to open our mouths. I have one more passage and then we'll be done here. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing the number of complaint by the Hellenists and robes against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in their daily distribution, and the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should be who we will appoint to this duty. This illustrates my point. There was a complaint that the widows of the church were not being assisted. So guess what? They solved the problem. A complaint of a need help create solutions. And then we see that the church grew out of this. Here's the thing. I like this quote. This is the sort of thing that illustrates why the church can do what no nation state can ever do. Here's the very thing that the world has been looking for and cannot find, yet this is what you will always have among true Christian people. Community. Hey, I don't have to wait for tomorrow to find my new heaven and new earth. I can find a chunk of that right now. But if we cooperate together and love each other with the kind of generosity that only Jesus brings, So, my brothers and sisters, your life may not be perfect, your actions may be flawed, your sins may be very real, but we've been redeemed to do great things daily. Today, we've been called to bring hope into other people's lives. As much as you want hope for your lives every day, you've also been called to bring that hope that you have and to share it and sprinkle it and just extend it out to everyone daily. But it starts right here among us. To care for each other when the money dries up, to care for each other when our food supplies shrink, to care for each other when we suffer tremendous loss. For when one of us suffers, we all suffer. Just quick three points now. What can you do? Well, you can obviously give to the church. I mean, that's a simple, obvious answer. That's just an obvious answer. First Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, the early church gave to help the needy saints in Jerusalem. In fact, one of the big 
contributions throughout the New Testament is this big kind of global collective collection for the church in Jerusalem. But if you need help, let us know what you need. And how some of us are. One day down the road can be God's kingdom to us. Finally, if you've been blessed with abundance, Find a way to use it to help someone else. I'm blessed by God's people. I know what the kingdom of God looks like in the hearts of God's people. But some of us don't experience that quite often enough. Church is a beautiful place. I still believe in the church today, that it can be the church of God's original intent today, that we can taste the good things of the kingdom of God today, that that right there is hope for the world that it so desperately needs, burdened and carried by Jesus Christ himself. Thank you so much for this, for your attention today. Thank you so much for indulging me today. And as we extend the invitation, we ask that you uh, think about what we were talking about. Think about how perhaps you need to change the way you look at your possessions. Look at how you uh, change the way you might express your needs or be willing to fill a need when you see one. God's kingdom is made up of you, not someone else. You. So if you have any need, please let us know all together. Stand and hey, thank you so much for watching our videos and content. If you want more videos, more content, and want to know more about us, visit our website or subscribe to us on YouTube and like us on Facebook. We'll see you next time.